Hello, I'm Robert Morgan. Uh, I'm a game writer and a narrative designer, whatever that is. And this is the first of a series of talks on game stories, how they work, why they do the way, why they do things the way they do, why they often don't work, and how they're different to books and TV. Basically, I'm going to be trying to put names to some of the things that we see in games all the time. And it, we'll mostly be talking about things that we all come across all the time in games and go, oh yeah, that thing, that thing there, that thing, you know, where, uh, and it's usually things that we're really familiar with, but which we don't have a name for yet. Now, why is that important? I studied literature. And in literature, there's kind of this corpus of technical terms that describe not what a story is about, but what's happening in it and how it works. You don't need to know these to be a good writer, thank God, because I can barely remember what an adverb is, and I studied literature. But the fact is there's a tool, there's a toolkit that exists to help us maintain a conversation and also to help us maintain a collective memory of how stories work and how components of stories function. Now, we do have some of these in games, <laughs> but they are usually about what happens in the story, not about how the story works, not about the individual components of a story breaking it down into functionality. Why does this matter? Well, it's useful to be able to put a name to, you know, that thing where, that thing where you're forced to make a choice that you don't want to make, or that thing where you're forced to make a choice that you don't agree with, Last of Us. <laughs> because it's part of how we preserve games. Now, this isn't just about putting a name to, oh, you know, that thing where, say, you're given loads of med kits before you face a big boss. That's a thing that it's easy to spot. It's a cliche or it happens in a lot of games. It's easy to make a joke and put a name to it. If you're looking for that sort of thing, TV tropes already exist and that's what I urge you to look at if you're not familiar with it. It's rather like, I once discovered, because I'm not technical at all, I'm a writer, and I discovered when I first started looking into programming to do my own tiny little bits that 90% of programming actually consists of Googling the problem, finding a solution, and kind of copying and pasting most of it in. And a lot of my illusions were destroyed the day I found that out. TV Tropes is like that for stories because writers do that as well. The problem is, too often, we store our memories of games like this. It's something that you just have to be there for. Just play it and you'll understand. Maybe if you get the hardware or the emulators together, you can play it and maybe you'll understand, but maybe not. But there are other ways of storing this information. I studied literature at uni and I want to let you into a secret. Studying literature does not mean reading everything by a long chalk. I'm actually very, very poorly read for a literature student. What the, what the whole thing gives you is a toolkit of things where you can read a book and say, ah, right, it's like that moment in that Dostoevsky book, you know, the one with the grinding misery. No, not that one, the other one. <laughs> because once you can put a name to something, you can start to index it, you can start to preserve it instead of endlessly saying, you know, that thing where. Now, the point isn't to come up with an inaccessible stack of words, or to stress about the definition of chiasmus versus anti-metaboli. No, they're not transformers. <laughs> For those interested, this is what they are. And yes, technically, I am supposed to be able to remember the difference. Instead, what I want to do in these talks is come up with a list of terms for things that we're all familiar with, which are new terms, which hopefully will be a way of us continuing to talk about how game stories work, why they don't work, and how to make them work differently. And because I want them to be remembered, I decided to put these words in the dominant medium of our time. So, <laughs> feel free to participate. And also I decided, instead of naming this series Towards the Poetics of Game Narrative, I decided to call it what it is. It's kind of a, a utility belt of bat tools that allow us to describe what's happening in a narrative. So, <laughs> all wrapped up in a neat little package. <laughs> Episode one, dramatic irony. Now, this is about not just irony, which we already kind of have a weird relationship with in the modern world anyway. No, Alanis, having rain on your wedding day is not inherently ironic. If, you, if you're a weatherman or weatherwoman, or if you uh, have a, sun, a sunny weather themed wedding or something, then it might possibly 
meet the definition of irony, but just the fact that it's raining on your wedding day is not definition, it doesn't meet the definition of irony. Anyway, I'm, I'm dating myself with this reference anyway. <laughs> Dramatic irony, drama plus <laughs> irony. This is a tool which forms one of the fundamental building blocks of how you make stories interesting. It's what starts to differentiate early literature, like the Greek epics, which are pretty descriptive. They describe what's going on in excruciating detail, from later more sophisticated literatures, where the audience starts to be an essential part of the experience. Now, the fundamental idea behind dramatic irony is there's a monster behind the door, and that is sort of interesting. And the characters are about to go through the door. And that's sort of interesting as well. But as audiences, we know that the monster is behind the door. And the characters on stage, or the characters in the book, or the characters on the screen, don't know that the monster is behind the door. And this creates an imbalance of knowledge. It creates a pleasing tension in the amount that we know. And so we're able to sit there and say, oh, don't go through the door. One of, if not the earliest novel, is based on this idea. Don Quixote, it's the spectacle. We get to watch as we're reading the book. It's the spectacle of a guy who, because he's read too much romantic chivalric literature, begins to see that sort of delusional aspect in everyday life. He sees windmills and he thinks that they're dragons. And we know that they're windmills. And so the spectacle, the humor, derives from the fact that we know differently to he does. When we get to Shakespeare, it's basically built around this whole idea, whether because it's really comedically useful to have a character who's attempted, who a king is attempting to seduce, and we know that they're actually a woman dressed as a man, or because tragedy functions in roughly the same way. If we witness somebody about to make a tragic mistake because they believe something incorrectly, and we know that they're incorrect, and we watch them make the tragic mistake anyway, it creates a tension, and that's what stories run on. It's the point where a story starts to become aware of its audience. It's almost the point where story first starts to become interactive. And yet, in games, the standard rules of dramatic irony just don't seem to apply. It doesn't seem to work in the same way. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, because you may have seen me talk about this before. This is an experience that I had while I worked at PlayStation. I was working on an augmented reality Harry Potter game, not a film tie-in. It was an original title. So we had original material written by J.K. Rowling, which came down to us, and my job was to adapt it into the game. And what happened was, she'd written this beautiful introduction to a character who was going to do something bad to the player. And she just couldn't help herself from warning the player that it was going to happen. You were going to be kidnapped by this character, or portnapped, if you know your Harry Potter. He was going to trick you into touching a boot, which was actually a port key, which was going to transport you something else. And that's how we locked the player into the plot. It's just that the introduction to the character actually specifically warned the player that this character might do this. He has been known to try to trick people. He has been known to try to kidnap people. And so we gave the player a perfectly good reason not to do something that we really wanted them to do. And eventually, we just had to say, look, this, this isn't how games worked. I sat and looked at this passage and tried to put into words why it hasn't worked. And in a certain way, I'm kind of still doing that. Because it's this that makes games, ironically, a profoundly ironic medium. We participate in our characters' goals, our protagonists' goals, and games try to different extents to try to make us sympathize with or share the goals of our protagonists. The trouble with dramatic irony in games is that too often it's handled in the same way that it would be handled in a non-interactive medium, in a helpless medium. Because if you witness a character doing something that you know they shouldn't do in a helpless medium, then it creates a pleasing tension. It's dramatic irony. But if in a game you're forced to make a stupid decision and you know better, it's like the friggin' Ludovico technique in terms of discomfort and bad experience for the player. Which is why I want to make the first hashtag in our narrative utility belt <laughs> the idea of a protagonist with whom we don't, not only don't sympathize with, but we start to move away from their motivations and start to make it that, like, they just start to look a little bit foolish. Now, I love the Assassin's Creed games. I will play them to death. But in the most recent Assassin's Creed game, there is a good example of this. You go into a, char into a new relationship with a character who, because it's, just an, it's, a, it's an Assassin's Creed game, they essentially want you to kill somebody, and you do it on the strength of their word, and then it turns out that they weren't who they said they were, and they actually got you to do their dirty work for them. It's just that they can't help themselves in terms 
of lingering the camera just a little bit longer during the introductory cutscene. They seem sinister. They seem untrustworthy because of the way the cutscenes are shot, because of their dialogue, because of the little smiles that the character shares with the camera, but doesn't share with the protagonist. You feel stupid for going along with it because the audience, the player, is being told information that the protagonist isn't privy to. And so the time that we spend trying to be the protagonist or trying to sympathize with the protagonist, we're also experiencing feeling like he might be kind of dim. There's no consequence to it either. You don't learn anything. There's only anger. And worse, the game never gives you a better reason to kill any of the people that you kill subsequently. You still do it basically on the strength of one person's word. You go into the same situation and kill people for exactly the same reasons. It's just that the people who told you to do it proved to be more trustworthy. And so it actually takes away the pleasure of mindless killing, the core of the games. <laughs> The next time you go to kill a stranger, the blush is kind of off the rose a little bit. And this is because a protagonist is an interface. There are extension into the game world. There are hands in the game world. So if they're dumb, we have to be able to understand their dumbness. Or more accurately, we need to be made to sympathize with their dumbness, not encouraged to criticize it. Forrest Gump is a masterpiece of dramatic irony because we understand what's happening better than he does. That creates an imbalance of knowledge that's interesting. But in games, the closest we get to this is games where we just luck our way into success. And no, you will never convince me that Rocket League is anything other than a lottery simulator where you play as one of the balls. The trouble is when you try to put this into the story. In Dishonored, another example and it barely qualifies as a spoiler to tell you that some people really betray you because they are hysterically evil it's not even funny how evil they are and how silly you feel going along with it and drinking anything that any of them have been anywhere near because they're so ridiculously evil if you want to do if you want to do distrust in your game you can't just perform it you have to simulate it. What does this mean? If you're going to have a character who seems untrustworthy and is, then it's worth considering also having a character who seems untrustworthy and isn't, or at least seems trustworthy and proves to not be trustworthy. You have to teach the, the user to distrust their instincts before they're going to feel anything like actual distrust. Because the point of the, the fun of pointing out how ridiculously evil Uncle Scar is just doesn't work in games. Alternatively, you might want to genuinely surprise your player, set them up with someone that, he, that they genuinely trust, and then that person betrays them. And plenty of games do this well. Bioshock, Deus Ex, Dragon Age. The trouble is, surprises aren't all that interesting. Shocks wear off, or shocks date. Sometimes really badly, and worst of all, surprises can be spoiled. Dramatic irony is something different. It's not about surprising the player. It's about telling the audience what's going to happen and then watching them squirm as it happens. So does this mean that dramatic irony is just a dead end? Does player agency mean that it's an impossibility in games? Well, no, I refuse to accept that because as a writer, I don't want to let go of such a powerful tool. The trouble is, as we've already heard this evening and as others, including Matt Bock, have spoken about, games, most games are basically entitlement simulators. They're not just about making you feel powerful. They're also about giving you a world which needs you, where you're the most important person, and where if you play correctly, you can definitely succeed. But the minute you start lying to the player or tricking the player, you start to create an imbalance in knowledge, and that's the foundation of irony. And because of this, dramatic irony isn't going anywhere. There are plenty of games where the protagonist has more knowledge than the player, which is kind of an interesting inversion of the effect. And that's an effect that you can see for good or bad. This is from Medal of Honor. You can't see very clearly because it's not a very good screenshot. It's from Medal of Honor Warfighter. It's the beginning of the game, and it gives you no more information than this. There's a man. He's got a headscarf on, and you have a gun pointed at him, and the only command you can input is to fire. Besides, as players, we always know that it's just a game. And this gives us an incredibly powerful knowledge. We know that when the game gives us a huge stack of medkits, it's because there's a monster behind the door. So that's where we can start surprising our players, maybe by just taking the monster away. Do games require a consensus, an equal level of knowledge between protagonist and player? No, 
But we might need a new word because we might need to break down the idea that the character and the protagonist are the same entity with the same knowledge to be lied to or tricked in the same way. We might need to start seeing protagonists who are as fallible and as foolable as we are. Which brings me to my final hashtag. <laughs> if you're going to have distrust in your game, you have to seed it and make it make sense. You have to have people who seem untrustworthy and prove trustworthy. And you have to know that you're going to have to manipulate the player's instincts of trust. If you're going to have a protagonist who's fooled in your game, then you need to know that the protagonist and the player aren't the same person. You need to have a protagonist who isn't infallible until suddenly they're not, or whom no one lies to until suddenly they do, or whom no one lies to until suddenly they do because it's the right story beat. And if you're going to have dramatic irony in your game, it can't be like rain on your wedding day because we can't control the weather. We can only control ourselves. The weather can't make a fool of you. You can only make a fool of yourself. You should have brought an umbrella. <laughs> and when games try to make us feel a fool for something we couldn't control, it's not dramatic irony. There's no monster behind the door. The game just spawns the monster behind us. And that's where I want to leave it. Thank you very much.